I'm Brent Kreiso, and you're listening to session number four of the Herd of Turtles podcast. Time will take you and fade you in the new sun. See the colors run, come out of the water. And I will fake it until I make it. Pockets pulled and hanging out. Walking hey guys, welcome back to the Herd of Turtles podcast. I am your host, Brent Kreiso, and on today's show, we are featuring Emma Ballou from Eastport, New York out on Long Island, out by the Hamptons. And aside from being a great artist, Emma is one of the kindest, most gentlest people I've ever come into contact with. She's the type of person that made me realize I might need to up my game in being a compassionate, caring individual. And uh, spending time with her just makes you want to be a better human overall. In the interview, we talk about her journey of becoming a full-time artist and how she went from being a museum curator to using art as a form of therapy to help cope with her anxiety to being a full-time artist. As anyone who's ever tried to create knows, we all have an inner critic and a voice in our head that might try to prevent us from following through in the creation of something new. When you create something, you have to be vulnerable and open yourself up to criticism, which can be scary and stop you dead in your tracks if you let it. Emma gives some valuable advice on how to overcome that fear and to push past that, and I think that will be useful for everyone listening. We also talk about how she is able to produce a large amount of amount of art in a short period, such as her 30 and 30 push where she creates 30 finished paintings in 30 days in the process she needs to follow to be that creative. We also get to shed some light on the business aspect of the creative world and how she's using the internet to allow her to be a full-time artist. Emma can be found online at emmabaloo.com and Baloo is spelled B-A-L-L-O-U. So emmabaloo.com is her own website. She has two Instagram accounts, emma.baloo.artist for her paintings where she features those, and also baloo underscore sky underscore studio where she showcases her popular constellation glasses that are very unique. They're also available on her Etsy store, which can be found under baloo sky. The wine glasses make for excellent gifts. And if you have anyone out there that is hard to buy for and seems to have everything, you need to get them a set of these wine glasses. My wife and I have given them out as gifts, and they've always been a success. They are as unique as they are useful. So without further ado, let's get into the interview. All right, so we're here with Emma Ballou down on Long Island, New York. Welcome, Emma. Thank you for having me. You are welcome. Glad to have you. So, Emma, where are you uh, right now? Are you in your studio painting? I am actually currently in my living room. Um, my studio is outside in um, my garage, and I have to. I have a wood burning stove in there, so I thought it'd be a little bit cozier in the house because I haven't been keeping it going as much as I usually do. That's probably a smart move. Is it pretty chilly yeah. down there? It is. It's like in the 30s, um, but it's probably colder up where you are, I'm sure. Yep. And I guess we should go over where exactly are you out on Long Island? So I live uh, in Eastport, which is um, about, it's closer to the Hamptons. So it's the east end of Long Island on the South Fork. Yeah. And along that line, as I was doing some research, uh, are you close to where Jackson Pollock's studio was? I know that's yeah. not too far away. Yeah, it isn't too far away. It's in East Hampton, and it's close to East Hampton in a town called Springs. And um, I actually, my first art show on Long Island was about a year ago, and it was in Ashawag Hall in Springs. So it was right down the road from Jackson Pollock's old studio. Yeah, which is a it's a beautiful and. Um, very inspiring place to be as an artist because um, it has a long history of artists and the light on the East End is pretty well known in uh, outdoor painting. It's called plein air paintings. Plain air, is that a certain type of technique then or you're just saying the yeah, quality of um, light? Yeah, so in Southampton, uh, William Merritt Chase, who's a very famous uh, famous painter, started the first uh, plein air painting school, which is just 
this, it was a new thought at the time, like in the late 1800s, that you would go out into the environment and paint. Um, previously, it was always done in studios, um, you know, like looking outside or just from memory or, but it was kind of like being in the elements while you were painting that scene that was kind of a new movement uh, at that and time. What- and what time was that? When did that come about? Uh, late 1800s. And the school continued into the early 1900s. Can you tell I was a museum curator? I, I, um, I, so- <laughs> I think we'll touch upon that. But yeah, yeah. yes, that, that's, um, you know, all those. I know my history. <laughs> I just because say all those dates, I'm sure they, they are very valuable to someone somewhere. Um, yes, yeah, somewhere, but, sometime, hopefully. <laughs> so th- that's interesting. And just to kind of you know, touch upon your history knowledge. Um, so like the Impressionists over in, in France, I, I, at least, you know, I'm thinking Monet, um, uh, they, was this happening at the same time? Was this, uh, or was this just a, an American version of kind of um, being out in the elements or did they not paint over there out in it? And it was more from memory. It was a, uh, a new school of thought for America. So America, like, was getting stuff a little bit later than what was happening over in France and England and, you know, in Europe. So um, it was new to Americans, especially the wealthy socialites of New York City and Newport, you know, all these kind of wealthier women that had free time to explore these different crafts and and um, art forms. And so it was a pretty popular school in awesome. Southampton. Yeah, it has a really great history. Awesome. So it's a beautiful place, the East End of Long Island. I I've heard it's uh it's a it's a little more remote too than what most people might think. Or am I mistaken? No, that's true. Um it's uh once you're on the island it's great, but it's pretty hard to get off of it. <laughs> like and so it makes you not want to travel around too much and I think it deters some people from coming out, but uh, if you're living in the city, we live about an hour and a half or two hours from New York City um, driving. And so it's a pretty convenient way for New York City people to escape to the Hamptons and such. Yes, if you can bankroll the uh, the real estate fees, right? You got it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about kind of where you came from and what you were doing. And uh, you mentioned that you was curator for a museum. Can you talk a little bit about what exactly was your specialty, where that museum was, and uh, some of your experiences there? Sure. Um, Well, I went to college um, at at Goucher College in Baltimore, and I studied uh, history and studio art separately, not art history, but American history mostly and some Asian history and then studio art. So once I graduated, I had done several museum internships, and one of those internships was actually at the Southampton Historical Museum on Long Island. And um, we actually moved, uh, my husband and I, um, Matt, moved from uh, D.C. to Long Island for his job. So I actually ended up starting um, my own job as a curator in Southampton. And I was there for almost six years. Um, when I decided to change and start my art career. And was art something that you had been doing on the side ever since you graduated college and you was kind of always floating in the background? Or was it something you had kind of put to the side and said that was a different time and then slowly kind of seeped back into your, your daily habits in your life? Yeah, so my um, family is very artistic. Um, My mom is an artist, my uncle, my aunt, my grandparents were all artists. So I think growing up, I was kind of like, oh, just another artist. Like, oh, just join the group, like whatever, no big deal. So I never thought doing artwork, even though I was very encouraged by them, it just wasn't that big of a deal or not something, since it was all something that they did on the side, they weren't like full-time artists that I didn't really think of it as a full-time career. I just did it because I love to. And that's kind of what I did in college as well. I I never thought that it would be something I could do full-time. So I never really considered it. And then, um, so I was, then I was like, fast forward several years, I was on Long Island, um, working at the museum. And 
I, I just had a lot of anxiety. I was having a lot of different anxiety problems. Um, and I was going to therapy and then my therapist was like, well, what do you love to do? And I was like painting and I hadn't done it for several years. And it, it, that was what really got me going, um, in the art world was just as a therapy, um, relaxation, meditation, a different way to express myself that I was kind of lacking at that time. And oh my gosh, it changed everything. That's kind of when I'd say about three years ago is when I started focusing more on it and starting to take it more seriously. How long after you began to kind of dip your toe back into the art world, did you think that it was a viable uh, occupation, a way to uh, earn a living? So I wasn't, even though I loved my job at the museum, um, I, you know, I loved what I did on a daily basis. There wasn't a real future for me there. And I could see that there wasn't any place for me to grow. But on paper, like I was paid well for my profession. Like I had really flexible hours. I enjoyed what I did, but there wasn't a lot of growth there for me. So that's kind of when I started mulling around, like, oh, like, what other things can I do? Like, that, and I always had this, like, strong feeling like I needed to be my own boss. I, like, really just, I, I, not that I had a problem with authority, but I just really wanted to be my own boss and wanted to, um, you know, have, if I really was interested in, interested in something, I wanted to pursue it, and I wanted the freedom to be able to say, Yes, I want to work with you. No, I don't want to work with you. This is a good idea, not a good idea. I wanted that and I kind of craved it. So I would sit with my husband and, you know, we would brainstorm different things that I could do. And I was really getting back into painting and I was enjoying it. I was posting things on like Facebook. I didn't have Instagram at the time, but on Facebook and people were interested in it, like potentially buying it. And that there's nothing like in my opinion, more rewarding than creating something out of nothing and then having that thing that you created speak to someone else to the point where they want it in their life. And I think that spark is kind of what started me on this journey. But um, initially, I opened up an Etsy store because I was like, oh, I can't. I was still kind of in this mindset like, oh, I can't just paint and have that be a career, kind of like what I was talking about before. So I was like, oh, this has, I have to have a product. I have to have, um, you know, a business plan. I have to create something that a lot of people will like and kind of like almost mass produce something. So I came up with these um, Constellation wine glasses, which are getting bigger and bigger still. I'm not doing anything to promote them, but I do have an Etsy store called Blue Sky Studio that sells these Constellation wine glasses. So that was initially couple years ago my side hustle that's what funded me buying my art supplies that's what funded me kind of like are giving me a reason to create more so I owe a lot to that and do you still enjoy doing those wine glasses or and why they may be great because they they provide income is it something that you're like oh another order of wine glasses or do you still get that that excitement that people value what you're doing? Um, I still surprisingly still get that um, kind of spark as long as it isn't taking away from my painting. Right now I've kind of um, kind of decided with myself that I'm going to not push it or promote it and I'm not going to like hustle my Etsy store. I'm going to be spending my time pushing my artwork more because that's something I can see doing for the rest of my life, like long term. Um, while, I, but luckily, a couple of years ago, I pushed my wine glasses really hard, and it got very popular on um, Pinterest and different blogs, wedding blogs. So that's kind of coasting. So I really don't have to dedicate much time to it at all anymore, and I've streamlined my process to the point where, like, you know, I barely have to think when I do them. It's kind of chill, relaxing. I put on some Netflix, I paint some wine glasses and I ship them out. So it's, it's a really, that's what makes it a perfect side hustle for right now. But I, I think my glasses are really trendy 
right now, but I don't see it being a sustainable um, business model going forward. They are great wine glasses. I know that we've bought several for gifts, so uh, they're they're. I, I have really a, cool. quite a few myself. <laughs> I'm, sh- I'm sure <laughs> I you enjoy do. them. <laughs> Either that's a sign that you drink too much wine, or <laughs> you just like painting glass, uh, or maybe of- both. <laughs> <laughs> yes, maybe both. So I I, I want to get into the whole uh, you know belief that an artist in yourself and. Uh, you know, the confidence that it takes to be creative and to kind of put yourself out there. Um, but I, I want to get touching that subject from a little different angle, though, first. Uh, right now, I know through your Instagram that you are promoting a, is it 30 and 30, 30 paintings in 30 days? I'm not quite sure what yeah, the title is. Yeah, that's right. That's correct. Yep. Where are you getting your inspiration for 30 paintings? I mean, that that's a lot of output in 30 days. So, Oh, my God. It's so much. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the first time, this is the second time I've done this kind of push and um, project is there's a artist group out here that um, I knew one of the artists in the group, and they're called 30 Squared. And they um, get – they – do it usually in January when it's really quiet and you're inside a lot and there's not a lot of other things going on. And, um, they, we all do it as a group together. So 30 paintings in 30 days. Um, what makes me a little crazy is that I do 30 finished paintings in 30 days. Um, they usually think of it as like, you know, if you just do a little bit of art, you know, you just paint or you work on a large piece for every day for 30 days. I think I'm the only one that was like insane enough to just be like, I'm going to finish 30 paintings in 30 days and have them ready to be sold like the week after, (laughs) you know, but that's where the inspiration for that came from. Um, But for my subject matter um, this time around, I'm kind of just letting anything that tumbles out of me tumble out. I'm using it as, a kind of therapy. I have a a lot of these different ideas bouncing around in my head and I just want to get them all out and kind of see at the end of these 30 days, what's left standing. What am I still drawn to? What am I really excited to like do a larger study on this one type of painting? So I know if I had to write 30 songs as I'm a, uh, a guitar hack, you know, but I've written a couple songs, but if I had to write 30 songs, one a day, I know that I might find a couple good ones out of that, and the rest I could probably crumple up and throw into a waste bin. Uh, do you feel that way about your art, or do you feel generally when you've gone through this process and you get to the end, you're like, yeah, I'm, I like everything I've done, or like, what's your internal process as far as like judging and putting out your work? Do you feel when you go through a 30 day process, do you say, well, 15 of these are worthy of putting out there and 15, uh, are interesting work, but they're kind of more of a, a study rather than a finished product. Um, my inner critic is very healthy. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it can be louder some days than others, but, um, so I, I would say, Traditionally, I would want to keep probably one in 10 paintings that I do. Um, I, I, I have a, I love the process of painting normally, like sitting down, painting, creating something. And at the end of it, sometimes I'm like, oh, that's crap. I don't know who's going to buy that. <laughs> but, um, but the funny thing is, is that you you can't always trust your inner critic, especially when you're creating something from scratch. Um, it could, and art in particular, it could mean so much, such a different thing to somebody else. And I can't tell you how many times I've like gone to an art fair or an art show, I'll be like, oh, I'll just throw this in because I need to fill this wall, or I have a hole here. Like, oh, who cares? Like, if no one buys it, whatever. I have all these other nice ones. And then at the end of the day, it's all the paintings that I was not that crazy about that ended up selling so (laughs) you 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 can't judge yourself too harshly um you have to 
open yourself up and keep opening yourself up to that vulnerability, you know, that, you know, what if nobody likes it? That's the, that's always the scary part that not a lot of people talk about in the art world. And that's why there's a lot of big egos out there, like kind of compensating, I think for that scariness, but it's a, uh, it's a, you have to be very humble and know that when people have opinions about your artwork, it isn't always, it's not directed at you in particular, you know? I, I can believe that, that, you know, it, it's something you created and yes, it's part of you is in it, but you also need to create that distance. I, I would imagine at some point. So along that line too, you've got on your website, which is great. And I would like to talk a little bit about that down the road here. Uh, but you've got in your um, available art, a bunch of really cool paintings, but you've got different prices on things. And so is part of your process, like in judging it, is it, will it sell or uh, how do you come up with like a price for your paintings? I, I think that would be very hard for me to do because uh, it's such a personal thing. And so how do you begin to say, yes, I believe that this is worth X. And if that's worth X, then this other one is 2X or whatever the price point may be. How do you um, kind of come up with your pricing structure and your judgment of paint paintings? Is it based on selling or is it based on the end quality, I guess? Oh, that's such a good question. And every artist I know, including myself, struggles <laughs> with that. Um, so the nice thing is, is that I'm not working with a gallery right now that takes commission, which is a whole nother thing. Uh, gallery, a lot of people don't realize that galleries um, take about 50%, if it's good, 50 to 60% of the price of the artwork. So that kind of changes your pricing if you're showing with a lot of different galleries. But right now I'm not, I'm part of a, a collective and I sell my stuff online. So I'm able to set my own prices. Um, but the, I would say it's a mix between what, how much I love the painting, how good I think it is for me and what has sold previously for that amount. And, um, some paintings I'll paint and I'll be like, oh, I love that one so much. Like, it's worth this to me and I don't even care if it doesn't sell. Like, if someone isn't willing to buy it, then whatever. I'll just keep it myself and it's worth that to me. That happens every so often. But for the most most part, I base it on the size and what people have paid for a similar painting of mine in the past. Uh, like, I'm very new, early in my career and so a lot of people would think that, you know, my prices, you know, every, everybody's different, but a lot of people have said like, oh, your prices are so low. And I'm like, well, like I'm starting out. I, and I, I'm very good at producing a lot of artwork right now. So I think that's, um, I want to take advantage of that while I'm in this kind of creative mode of producing, producing and um, get some more artwork out into the world. But it's, it's a ba balance and I kind of play with it. You always have to revisit it every six months or so and kind of like see like what stuff of mine has sold for what amount and then look at how I've grown as an artist in the past six months and just be like, okay, should I be upping it a little bit or is it good? Or So it's a, it's a balancing act. I'm sure it is because the mindset that you were just saying, because I'm starting out and I'm not that known, and yes, it helps to have a, a better, a bigger name in any field. You know, you can command more of a price. But I think one of the other mistakes that a lot of people knew to it, and I fall prey to it sometimes as well, is you kind of undervalue what you're bringing to the table. And just because you're new doesn't mean your paintings or whatever you're producing, whatever widget it may be, uh, there's still intrinsic value and value to the people who buy it. And so, um, you know, it, it's always that tough question that you say you need to revisit because you begin to say, I'm worth more. Well, you were always worth more. You just didn't know it or have the confidence to do that. Yeah. And my skill is getting better all the time and I'm refining my style and my technique and, you know, like I'm tightening up how I create, so my prices need to reflect that as I grow, but you're totally right. It's 
it's very dangerous game if you start selling yourself short because, and that's, but like few artists that I know, um, I'm taking this very seriously. Like this is my full-time job. But the thing is, is that a lot of artists that I know don't do that. You know, it's kind of like a side thing that they dabble in. They might do an art show every now and then, but like I eat, sleep and breathe this. And so I think that because I'm dedicating so much of my time and energy to it, like the prices need to reflect that as well. I agree. And along that line, that was one of my questions is, why does Emma believe that you can make a go of this when maybe someone out there with just as much talent or, you know, we could say more, doesn't have that drive? What is it about you that gave you the confidence to say, I'm going to give this a shot? I'm just not accepting that I can't do it, kind of, if that makes any sense. It's, it's such a mindset. You know, like, sure, there might be days where, like, well, yesterday I had a day painting where, man, I couldn't, like, paint anything good. Like, I painted for, you know, eight hours, and it was just, like, I had one good painting come out of eight hours. And this morning I painted, and in three hours I had two good paintings come out of it. So that's, that's like, knowing in my soul that it's okay to have those days and not be defeated by those days where I'm just like, okay, that was no good. That was no good. Just to have faith in myself that that next day I I'm going to wake up and it's going to be better or it might be in a week. You know, it's that being able to ride the waves and the valleys of self doubt and frustration, just to have enough faith in yourself that you're going to come out of it on the other end better. You know, it's not even just that you're going to come out the same or a little bit less. Like, I have this belief that, you know, challenge and overcoming obstacles and growth only improves everything that you do. Your relationships, your, your, what you create, how you live your life, it all gets better on the other side of that. And that, I think that helps me with starting my own business and kind of And then listening to podcasts too, hearing that there's communities out there that do this all the time that, you know, start their own business, that they ride those waves of insecurity and, you know, bad days and that it takes about two years for a new business to really like get its legs and you just have to like hold on and keep pushing and pushing for that amount of time. And, you know, just knowing that it just doesn't happen because social media you know, Facebook, Instagram, blogs, like they all, you, you just kind of see these people that have made it in your opinion. And you, you just think that they just woke up one day, went on Instagram, started posting all these amazing things and then bam, they made it. But you don't see those, you know, four years, five years of the struggle or the, you know, the days that they don't want to do it anymore. You know, social media doesn't show you that. But just knowing and hearing the stories of different people that have done what I'm doing and have put in the time to get where they are and it's a success, I think that's what keeps me from, like, keeps me believing in myself that I can accomplish whatever I firmly believe that I can. I think those are some really wise words, Emma. I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> Have you, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about the community support that you have there and how vital your structure and how vital that is to any success. But uh, just in what you were just speaking about, are you familiar with Gary Vaynerchuk? He's, no. Uh, he's now kind of a social media maven, I guess it might be the best term. Um, He's got a social media um, advertising company, but he's really big on social media. And he took his uh, father's small little uh, liquor store in New Jersey and built it to a $60 million a year uh, retailer. And he started on YouTube when no one else, when YouTube was brand new and he did it uh, day after day after day after day. And he goes, some days I'd have a couple views and that was it. And people said, don't sell 
whine on the internet. You're that's an impossible job. He just knew that that's where it was at. And he's like, you just got to keep working. Just what you were saying. You just got to keep going for it. And that a lot of people don't see all the hard work behind. So I, I think you, what you said is right on track with what the, the experts and the people are talking about there. It's about keeping your nose down and just keep doing the work. And there's another uh, podcast guy who does Entrepreneur on Fire, John Lee Dumas, says every master began as a disaster. And, you know, it's <laughs> like if you just keep working at it, like you're saying, there's just no other I'm going to get better. That's something that I deal with in my own life and deal with the podcast and everything else. But if you just keep working and you know that it's not perfection I'm chasing, it's progression and improvement. And uh, I, I think uh, that's kind of yes. what you were speaking about. Absolutely. I, I get really um, not frustrated, but just kind of like flabbergasted maybe with people that um, just – they lose face so quickly and they think that it all should just come so easily or, or like, Oh, I could do that. Like, sure. I could do that. Like, you know, I have the talent. I could do that. I'm like, but you're not, and you didn't. And that's the difference. You know, it's like the doers and the dreamers, you know, they're, it's when those two things come together, that stuff really magical happens. So I'm trying to do that for myself and I hope everybody is, you know, like if you, you can dream and do and you can have be separate, you can just be a doer that just does whatever is on their task list and then that's done or a dreamer that just constantly dreams and they never actually do anything that they're dreaming about. So, Yeah, and what you said about, uh, yes, you could have done it, but you didn't do it. And those who did yeah. succeeded. That's a real tenant in art, isn't it? That, you know, especially modern art, you know, yeah, why, abstract, why, especially exactly like, well, why is that art? And I know that's a whole concept, but that's not, uh, that's not art. I could have done that. Ah, but you didn't, did you? And they did. So that, that's the difference. You know, they, they got you to think about whatever that object may be in a different way. And that, that is the thought provoking aspect Brent, of art. I am impressed. Well, you know, <laughs> that I, was a great art reference and you nailed it. Very well, good. <laughs> yeah, I, I I used to one time I went to a museum and that was probably good enough for me. Oh, that yeah. one time. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was this little museum in Paris. I don't know if you've yeah. heard of it, the Louvre, but beyond oh. that, you know, it, that was that was my uh, big cultural experience. Um, Love it. Yes. So you talked about community and you said you're a member of a collective and what can you speak a little bit about what exactly is an art collective? Is it different than an art co-op? I've heard these terms and as an outsider, you're kind of, okay, what does that mean? And you said galleries and galleries chart take a 50% commission and, you know, they bring the marketing and the exposure to that. So you can, as an artist, you might feel they're taking too much, but as a gallery owner they probably feel that that's justified because a good gallery oh, will sell products but what's absolutely i think a good gallery that's selling your artwork that's pushing your stuff that's getting it out there finding the right people to buy it they deserve that for sure you know but um but in, until you find that gallery that's like a good fit for your artwork i don't know if it's a good investment in your time to pursue that so that's kind of my thoughts on that but um the collective I'm involved with is a, a group of six other young um, artists on Long Island that are taking their art careers very seriously. And I was um, contacted by uh, the person that had the idea to have this collective, Kara Hoblin, who's a friend of mine. She called me while I was driving up to Vermont and was like, hey, um, you need to let me know right now. Uh, do you want in on this collective? Um, it's going to be a couple other of my friends, and we're going to all go in on a space together in Greenport, which is this really cute uh, little port town um, on the North Fork of Li Long Island that's very similar to, like, Portland, Maine, the vibe of it, but much smaller. And um, it was a great location that just, like, fell into our laps, and she was like, if all of us chip in on the rent, um, we can open up a space for six months and we can show our artwork. There won't be any commission or anything. We can take turns um, uh, staffing it for one day a week and uh, it could be really good. So that's 
that's what the collective is in this case. Um, co-ops, collectives, they each one's a little different. Um, so this one's called the North Fork Art Collective. And um, yeah, it's a group of really talented young artists all getting together and kind of being a part of the community. We've had a, we're going to have two community shows. Um, we had one a couple weeks ago where we open up the gallery space that we quickly renoed um, to the public and we encourage local artists to come in and show their artwork um, who normally don't get to have a space to do that. That's awesome. You said that was a six month uh, lease that you guys have. Yeah. And it actually, um, it's ends in January, but it's reviewing like a pop-up. So after, after this, um, this space is done, uh, we are going to be looking for another place to pop up in the community. So it's even if we don't have like a physical space in that moment, we're actually going to um, be showing at local vineyards. Um, we already have a couple lined up and just kind of kind of be a collective collective even without a permanent physical space. Awesome. And how has that produced for you, I guess? Has that been productive or is, have you viewed it as, well, it's exposure and I'm still selling online, so uh, that works? Or how is that kind of? Um, my reasoning for it was because um, it was like, you know, I, I had to decide right then. Like she was just like, this is the deal. This is what's happening. Are you in or are you out? So I had to decide pretty quickly. I'm like, all right, well, the universe, I think, is telling me that I got to give this a try. So I'm in. So I signed up for it, not really quite knowing what it was going to be like. But um, my reasoning for saying yes to it was that it's like marketing, just like free marketing. Like reporters were going to love this story. We got a lot of coverage, a lot of press um, for free. And I was getting exposure to people that I wouldn't have before their friends, their community, everybody coming together. Um, so it was like kind of a no brainer. It was going to be worth the money, even if I didn't sell a piece to have the, the marketing PR of being in this collective of other emerging artists in my area. And, oh man, I'm so glad I did. And I've sold a good amount of work, um, through it. So it's been, profitable, but also um, just like the people I've met, um, the people that now follow me that have a couple new collectors, um, stuff like that, that's, that was even more successful than I thought it was going to be. So what percentage, I don't know if you're comfortable talking about, but how much of your sales come from the internet? How much from art shows like, like this collective or how much from going to a festival where you might uh, have a booth or something like that? Like how, how are you finding your sales mix? Um, so I just, it's important to note that I started being a full-time artist in mid July of this year. So it hasn't been that long. It feels like it's been years. Like, I can't believe it's only been that long. But I was doing it pretty seriously on the side for about a year and a half, two years maybe. Um, so it hasn't been that long that I've been a full-time artist. Um, but I've sold a ton of paintings, I think, for someone my age and how long I've been doing this. I think I've sold about... I want to say like 50 paintings this year wow. or so. Um, and it's, it's not like, you know, they range in size and, you know, price and everything, but I think I've sold about that many this year. And the, the places I've sold the most have been in, in random kind of galleries that I've had. Like I did this, um, show this feb this past february at a library in southampton and so i that was free i i set it up so that all of the people um coming in to view the show could buy my artwork online if they were interested in it because it was in a library i couldn't sit there and um man my gallery space for a month um so i made this really 
e- really well designed poster that made the instructions super clear that if they liked a painting, they could go online and purchase it. And that was probably the best way that I sold paintings so far. And it didn't cost me anything to be there either. So it's kind of about just being smart about the spaces that my art is hanging and skewing it to my advantage, I guess. So that was a successful one. But I've done a, um, I've had a good amount of success in um, selling them online through uh, social media like Facebook and Instagram. So, for instance, like I've been doing these 30 paintings in 30 days and today's the 13th and I've already sold four of them through Instagram and Facebook even before they're like officially released to the public as a collection in December. That's that's a great percentage, I would imagine. You know, was that uh, 30% or so? Uh, um, or, yeah, about 30%, 25%, 30%. That's, that's impressive, to say the least. And I think you, you making that poster, I think that is brilliant because I don't know how many times I've been to a restaurant where they might be uh, having an artist, you know, their artwork on display or someplace, and there's prices – there but they never it's never really clear how do i get a hold of the artist how do i purchase this uh, yes they're for sale and yes they're there for viewing and it adds to the space so it's beneficial to both the artist and the the establishment owner but to actually close a sale to bring the sale in sometimes it's like you got to do a lot of work to do that and so i think that was a great uh, move on your part and i'm glad to hear that brought you a success yeah and it's the, I, I'm always thinking about that like what what's the customer what's the viewer the visitor whoever is coming in and seeing my artwork like how does it look I'm, I'm pretty meticulous about um trying to make it a really nice environment um you know making purchasing anything easy and streamlined is the most important thing. So having a website that's easy to navigate and just clear and to the point, because, you know, just, just like any, like, just like Amazon or Target, they want you to have an impulse decision as much as possible. (laughs) Yes. And and remove the barriers to (laughs) purchasing, right? Like don't make the sale difficult. It's if you do all the heavy lifting and then don't, carry them across the finish line, then what's the point, right? Uh, and artwork is so hard to sell because it's it's a luxury item, you know, and, and to find the right person that has the money to purchase your artwork at the right time, that's the right style, the right, the, the right spacing on the wall, the, oh, it's, it's got a lot of barriers in its place. So. I'm sure. And, yeah. you know, you mentioned your website, and it's a beautiful, clean website. What did you, did you create that yourself? Yeah, I created it myself. Um, I taught myself Wix, uh, W-I-X. And uh, it's a very easy to use, um, you know, online template based. Like, oh my gosh, if I can do it, anyone can do it. Um, but it, it just needs to have uh, an eye for graphic design at least a little bit. And then you'll be good to go. It was very easy to set up. And um, I try to update it pretty frequently because I hate that you can always tell a stale website when you go on it, I've, or at least I can. I, I agree. I think there's you've got to stay. You don't want to be, uh, you know, follow fads, but uh, you want to keep it current. And yeah, and- or just in like what you're doing, you know, like have like updated photos of myself painting, or just to make sure that um, things that have sold or off of there, you know, or, you know, just trying to keep it like it's been touched recently. I think that kind of comes across even if you're not looking for it. Selling artwork on a web page is difficult, as you said. I think having good photographs, as you say, good graphic design uh, can assist those things. Well, I can tell you a story. I once had a um, customer purchase a painting and then when they got it, they were just like, oh, I thought it had more pinks in it. I don't want it anymore. <laughs> so they shipped it back and they picked out another one. But like, I can't, that's one of the challenging parts of this is that I can't see what they're seeing on their screen because each screen is so different and how the color is set, um, you know, things can look warmer or cooler or more pink or, you know, so 
that's that's a challenge that I don't know if there's a good answer to selling artwork online, but it's always better in person, always. But and do you take the pictures yourself? I would assume so, as you're kind of doing everything, not necessarily bootstrapping, but you're doing this all on your own. Or Low do you have... overhead is a good thing. Yes. <laughs> so um, I am doing it all myself. I have a, uh, a, a nice high res camera. Um, if you ask me what it is, I don't think I could tell you, but it's I, I at least have figured out how to take a, a really good high res photo of my painting. Some are harder than others, but um, most of the photos I take from my website are just my um, iPhone, and I've gotten to be really good at editing photographs on my iPhone. There's all those good editing apps out right now. So, Emma, you said that you use Pinterest and Instagram and Facebook and what have you. Do you believe that you could have made this move to being a full-time artist, say, 10 years ago, before all of these apps and all of this exposure, do you believe that these tools have allowed you to create a profession out of your passion? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I, I don't think I would have. If I hadn't had these different tools to see that other people were doing this, that um, there was a movement happening, you know, that, that I could do it too by using these tools, I, I don't think I would have um, done it because I'm not as drawn to the traditional artist lifestyle or a way that they sell their artwork. I, I think it's the lifestyle of, you know, having an online shop and using sh social media to make sales. And that's the power of that and the liberation to, of being my own boss and setting my own schedule and using these tools that I now have, um, has created, this lifestyle and world that I can create my artwork in that I don't think would have been possible 10 years for me to envision. And I don't think I would have liked it as much. The, the freedom that comes with this is huge. And that's, that's what I've really fallen in love with. The, the freedom to create my own schedule, to be my own boss, to sell my artwork the way that I want to and when I want to. Um, it, it's invaluable. And even though I sometimes will be like, oh, you know, like I got to do another Instagram post and oh, I have so much editing to do or, oh, this is hard or I don't like how this looks, all of that stuff. I think the pluses outweigh the minuses for sure. So Emma, you've, you've told a pretty interesting tale of how you became a full-time artist and moved out of not not the corporate world, but uh, more of a nine to five job to begin to pursue something that really mattered to you, that spoke to you on a creative basis. And you're finding a way to make it self-sustaining and to earn an income doing it. So the question that I have now is, where do you go from here? Where do you see this leading? Where do you see yourself in five, 10, 15 years? Um, I think it's really important to have role models. Um, one of my role models is Emily Jeffords, who is somebody that um, has really made her artwork into a lifestyle and into a brand um, that anytime she releases a collection of paintings, they sell out like instantly. Um, so that's my goal <laughs> is to one day be able to, um, you know, get a, enough of a following where um, like what I'm creating, there's enough of a collectors out there that it, it won't be all of this sitting and waiting that, you know, that's, that's the dream is to be able to just create and have your artwork go out the door into different people's homes and then create again. So to, my goal is always to have more time to create. Um, so time that I can, you know, really sit down and just paint and do it for the process of, of painting and creating the meditating, the, you know, putting pen to can, I mean, a paintbrush to canvas. Um, so as much time as I can have doing that, it'd be great to one day have a studio assistant, you know, to help me with stretching canvases and taking photographs and doing some PR stuff for me. So that's a goal down the road as well. Um, but 
I, I think the biggest thing that I really want to accomplish is learning more about myself and what makes me tick and creating a lifestyle um, that is so in tune with who I am and having my artwork come out of that. So it's all about the journey, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a worthy and admirable goal of any sentient being. So mm -hmm. if, if you're on that path, I think many people don't even question that. And the fact that that is a desire for you just shows that I think you're on the right path. And the fact that you're producing beautiful art is also a good sign, too. It's, uh, it's really nice stuff. Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome. So, Emma, I'd just like to ask you another question or two, but how do you define success? Um, for me, success is not about money. Um, for a lot of people, it is, and that's cool. But for me, it's about the journey. And I think when I get to the point where I just can spend most days just being happy and fulfilled in what I'm doing and feeling like I'm making the world a more beautiful place, a happier place. Um, I think that's what defines success. I, I really, I'm not that great with finances. Like my husband's a financial advisor, so thank goodness for that. But um, money to me is a very abstract thing and happiness is how I define my success. So if I'm happy every day for a week, I think that is a goal right there. Success. That's what that is. Thank you. And do you believe that balance in life of the, the things that you that really matter to you, is that a possibility or do you think that that is more a myth, this concept of living a balanced life? Um, I think the journey of trying to have a balanced life is what's important. I don't know if the end result is fully possible to quadrant, you know, like have different percentages of your life, get the same amount of attention all the time. I think that's an unattainable goal. But the, the, the process in trying to make your life as full in all those different aspects of it is the important part. And if you, an artist taught me that because like, yeah, I can, you know, paint 30 paintings in 30 days, but I can't paint 365 paintings in 365 days. I need to stop and recharge and quiet that part of my life. Probably in December, I won't paint that much after this big push because I need to pay attention to other parts of my life and get that inspiration back to start off the new year and all these different projects I might have going on. So that's kind of what I think. I think balanced life is a good goal that you should always be trying to reach for, but even if it isn't quite attainable. Emma, I'd like to say thank you very much for spending some time with us and sharing your ideas and your thoughts and kind of your journey so far. And uh, if people want to find you, where should where's the best way to find you? I'm very active on Instagram and Facebook. My Instagram name is Emma dot artist. Yeah, and, and that's uh, Baloo B A L L O U. Blue. Yes. Yep. Not, not blue. I just want to make sure. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, my website is www.emmabaloo.com. So those are the best two ways to follow my artwork. And, um, I'm always happy to talk to anybody or if anybody has any questions or ideas or want to collaborate, I'm all about it. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Brent. It's been a lot of fun. You're welcome. So that was our interview with Emma Ballou. You can find her at emmabaloo.com, and there you can sign up for her newsletter so that you can be kept abreast of anything that she's doing in her world. You can also check her out on Instagram at emma.ballou.artist for her paintings and also the account that features the constellation glasses primarily at ballou underscore sky underscore studio. And if you're so inclined and you wanted to head over to iTunes and give this show, the Herd of Turtles podcast, a rating and a review, I would greatly appreciate it. You can also check out theherdofturtles.com 
where you can find the show notes and also the blog and anything that is going on in the herd. Look forward to having you join us for the next show. And until then, take care. Time will take you and fade you in the new sun. See the colors until next time, come take care, guys. Water, and I will fake it until I make it. Pockets pulled and hanging out, walking like a washing machine.